your point of view. And there were lots of different points he made in it, only some of which were followed by the studio. A good many of them were ignored. This whole setup stinks. Orson always said that it was rather puzzling to him why the studio turned against the film. He said they had loved all the dailies, but once they saw it put together, he said it kind of, it, it, it seems to have offended them in some way. I can understand it. I mean, Universal was not noted as being a studio of unusual cinema. And um, this was a pretty unusual film with the cross cutting and the darkness of it and the savagery of it. Touch of Evil was originally previewed in February in Los Angeles of 1958. According to Ernest Nims, who was the head of post-production at Universal at the time, after the preview, a woman came out to a studio executive and proclaimed that this was the ugliest, dirtiest movie she had ever seen and hit the studio executive with a handbag. By that point, the studio decided to go back and cut that version, which was 108 minutes, down to 96 minutes, which was what was released, which is a really bastardized version of even the preview version. But in 1975, Bob Epstein, a professor at UCLA, contacted Universal Studios. He was teaching a class in film, and he needed a copy of Touch of Evil. Universal sent him a print, and as the class was viewing this, he realized that there were scenes that were not in the version that he knew that were in this film. So he thought they had found Orson Welles' original cut, but it was only the preview version, which was not any closer than the uh, release version in some ways. In fact, had more shots by second unit director Harry Keller. The home video version, which says restored, is basically a hybrid of the short version and the long version, because the short version, though 96 minutes, has scenes that play a little longer. So what they did was they decided, okay, we'll take every long scene we can and we'll put it together and we'll come out with a super long version, even though the super long version was probably only about 45 seconds longer. But it was still further than Wells had ever intended, and it was not Wells' version. Rick is the one who had the idea of seeing if he could convince Universal Pictures to go to the memo and try to follow all the instructions in it. There was some resistance at first, but then eventually they said, okay, let's give it a try. And part of the job I had was to be a kind of a watchdog, to make sure that in a sense the instructions in the memo were adhered to. I was sort of like the designated Wells scholar, if you will. After reading the memo, I needed an editor that understood sound, and picture editorial content. So I had recently been to the LA County Museum where I had seen Walter Murch speak on his theories of sound and editorial design in regards to Apocalypse Now. I called Walter and I said, Walter, I have this Orson Welles project, this 58-page memo. I think you understand both his theory and picture and sound, and you are the only person I feel can carry out this project in the way Wells intended. The changes that he talked about in the memo were roughly divided into two parts. Um, half of them were trying to undo the damage that the studio had done, removing elements that the studio had put in in order to make the film clearer, in order to make it simpler for an audience. The other half of the notes were things that Orson himself wanted to change in his own movie. You have to understand that he had been fired really just a few months after the beginning of the editing of the film. So he hadn't had a chance to oversee all of the fine tuning of the film, which depends on tiny, tiny things sometimes. Ironically, one of the biggest changes in the film comes right away with the opening shot of the film. I have to say that we didn't change the length of the shot at all. What we did do was remove the titles that the studio had put over the shot in an effort to save time. Wells' original intention was to run the shot clean without titles and to have all the titles at the end of the film. Naturally, this means that you're adding two or three minutes to the length of the film, and they wanted not to do that, so all over the shot are titles. Mike Fitzgerald, who was involved in home video, had told me that there was a textless opening. The textless opening was used primarily for when they, for foreign distribution of the film. So they could put in French titles or Italian titles so that it didn't just have the subtitles underneath it. That was the first element that we found, the textless opening. Naturally, since they're putting titles on the film, they also put title music over the film. Now, Henry Mancini wrote the music. This film was Mancini's big break. 
He wrote a beautiful score for it. One of the pieces of music that he wrote, as per the instructions of the studio, was a section of title music. But Wells wanted to have something completely different, which was an interesting but complicated blend of different uh, pieces of music coming from the town itself. So as the camera moves from one area of the town to another, you also hear what they are playing on their radios. You pass by a nightclub and you hear what's going on in the nightclub. And then a car goes by and you hear the car radio. So at any one time, there might be three or four pieces of music seemingly coming from all of the shops and the nightclubs and the strip joints uh, and the car radios. Naturally, this montage did not exist before we did it. This was trying to approximate what Wells might have wanted based on other things that he'd done later on in the film. So I was able to take pieces of music from different places, also from a CD that Mancini had issued, which had all of the music that he wrote for the film. As a result of changing the soundtrack, you actually, in a strange sense, can see deeper into the image because the sound creates a deeper space that you move through, which reflects what Wells was doing with the camera, which was his original intention to begin with. Orson had a great appreciation for sound, the sound part of, of sound pictures, having come from the stage and radio, where he realized how much could be done on, on just soundtrack of radio dramas and shows and all that. The note that Wells spent the most time on in his memo was to try to urge the studio to restore his intercutting of the two stories of Charlton Heston and Janet Lee. I'll try not to be too long. Go on, Johnny. You wait at the hotel. I think in an effort to make the film simpler for what they perceived as a simple audience, the studio had flattened out this structure so that right from the beginning, you followed Charlton Heston's story for, I think, five minutes and you switched to Janet Lee's part of the story, and you followed that for five minutes. Ironically, by trying to make the film simpler, the studio complicated things because they told you that the film was going to be about Charlton Heston, and the woman's story, if you've thought about it at all, you think, well, it must not be so important because we're not with her. At the end of five minutes, suddenly, we heard her part of the story. This was not the way Wells had shot the material. What he wanted, and what we've now done, is to spend just as long with Charlton Heston as you can sustain. Captain, you won't have any trouble with me. You bet your sweet life I won't. And then at the right moment... As a matter of fact, Mike must be looking for me just about now. Go to Janet Lee's part of the story, follow her, and then at the right moment go back to Charlton Heston. This does two things. It teaches you that this film is going to be all about the separation of these two individuals. The other thing this intercutting does is tell you that both stories are important. The man's story is important and the woman's story is important. And how they relate to each other is important. One of the scenes that we removed from the film was a scene that the studio had shot to explain all the things that they thought were not understood by the audience. Even on his honeymoon, the chairman of the Pan American Narcotics Commission has Seriously. a sacred duty to perform. It simply was the two actors, Charlton Heston and Janet Lee facing each other, getting through all of the story points that the studio felt had not been touched on earlier. The studio did reshoot a number of scenes that Wells had shot. Unfortunately, the negative of Wells' original shooting was destroyed. Like the scene in the car between Janet Lee and Charlton Heston as they drive away from town looking for the motel. Stylistically awkward in the film because Wells' original shooting was on location. He had a camera mounted on the hood of a car and he was shooting in Palmdale. The studio in their reshoots would not spend the money to go to Palmdale, so they shot on the stage using a moving background behind the actors. It sticks out, but unfortunately we have no alternative. We, just, we simply have to use what they shot because the story requires it. We weren't working with exactly the same materials that the studio had at the time the memo was written, but we had almost the same materials. Sometimes he said, you know, in the sequence driving to the motel, we need more shots of oil derricks. Well, in the footage that we had to work with, which is the existing footage, there weren't any oil derricks that we had to draw on. So that was one thing we couldn't do. Would it be possible to ask those people next door to move, just to another cabin? See, I'm still trying to get some sleep. Where would you like me to take you, doll? Come on, read my future. 
You haven't got any. At the end of the film, there's another change in the relationship between Dietrich and Wells. He has gone to her house as a place of refuge, and somebody calls him from outside. He leaves that house and, in fact, never returns to it. He dies, never being able to go back to Dietrich. The way it had been cut by the studio, there was a final look between the two of them as he left. A subtle thing again, but what Wells wanted was to delay that look and have her look up only after he left the room. She was busy doing her accounts so that she hears the squeak of a chair, looks up and it's too late. His back is moving out of the room. What that leads to is her coming to the scene where Quinlan is killed because she hadn't yet said goodbye. There wasn't a moment of eye contact between them. Hank! As it turns out, she's too late. By the time she gets there, he's just falling into the water having been shot. There's another change in that same area. There's this long scene of Quinlan and Menzies walking over bridges and through oil derricks being tracked by Charlton Heston with a tape recorder. In the film, The Way It Was, Dietrich comes up and Wells falls into the water. Wells wanted a close-up of the district attorney's hands closing the tape recorder and shutting it off. And immediately after that door of the tape recorder closes with a big snap, Quinlan's body stumbles backwards into the river and falls with a splash. What Wells wanted to say was, I was killed by the tape recorder. In some way, this machine hit me, and that's the thing that did me in. It's all over, Susie. I'm taking you home. Home. We really felt like we were rewriting history, and we didn't know where we were going. We didn't know what we were doing for Wells. We didn't know at that point, as we were doing it, if we had a better film or a more flawed film. We just didn't know. We just executed each change. Then one night after about three weeks, we decided to watch the film. Walter and I sat there and watched for the first time the re-edit of Orson Welles' Touch of Evil. What we found was a more coherent, more commercial, more accessible movie. A movie that made sense at every plot point. So, turns out Quinlan was right after all. I don't think one can definitively say this is Orson Welles' version because, of course, Orson Welles never had the opportunity to execute this version and see it and react to it. But I think it's infinitely better than the longer version that just had the advantage of having more footage but without the shaping that was done so well in this reconstruction. Orson Welles is a great filmic artist and I've learned a lot from him because I studied his films. I studied them in school and I studied them after school. Um, he really is one of the more amazing geniuses who read all the books, read Eisenstein, and was able to put it in practice. So you can actually see a lot of the things that a lot of the other theorists talk about. The idea of you know, trying to create emotion through the movement of light and dark on a screen, you know, there's not very many directors that actually take those theories and put them to practice. Yeah, I think he's as close to a genius as anybody I've met in all my 60-some years in the business now. He's absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You know, as usual, there is this terrible consolation of being 40 years ahead of your time. You know, it's like he used to kid about it. He's, I wish I'd be on time some, sometimes, you know. It'd be nice to just be of the moment as opposed to always being ahead of yourself. I think it's wonderful that there's an attempt to make the cut that Orson Welles saw in his head 41 years ago. And I think Orson would be thrilled. I think he'd be so happy that the picture's coming out again and being seen. About a year or so before he died, I remember I was with him and he said, sort of in passing, and I can't remember what the reference to it was, but he said, God, how they'll love me when I'm dead. We're standing here at the corner of Windward and Pacific in Venice, California, which served as the location for the border town in Touch of Evil. And this actual intersection was very much the hub of that border town. And these buildings with the arches used to continue blocks in each direction and all the way down to the ocean. They've been torn down now for the most part, but they were still here when Wells shot the movie. <laughs>
Venice was built and developed by an industrialist named Abbott Kinney, and the idea was that it was a fashionable seaside resort. As the decades went by and oil started being pumped around here and the canals filled up with sludge and all, the whole area fell into disrepair. And at the time that Wells shot the movie, many of these buildings were vacant and falling down, and it added to the whole corrosive atmosphere and probably, in fact, suggested the location to him as that border town.